about 51 years ago, actually, sorry, 53 years ago, a boy asked me a question on a concept in Hasidus, and he had some scientific background, and so did I. He asked me, how could the Rebbe Rashab say that light of a star is uh, can be redone infinitely and the light expends nothing from the star the star loses nothing and can do this ad infinitum and this is an example of the power of god to express light uh, from himself from god's self and that god can do this and it doesn't take anything away from god god can express god's self ad infinitum and cause creation this does not change role to god at all in any way so the young men asked me look uh, everybody knows e equals mc squared that energy light is a form of energy and it requires a certain amount of mass mass times the speed of light is the equal to the energy that it emits so every element of energy is the result of mass brought to the speed of light squared whatever that's supposed to mean but the, the, the function is e equals mc squared so in order to get energy you have to expend some mass small amount of mass but mass nonetheless and therefore a star cannot emit light ad infinitum and that's backed up by scientific measurements the sun loses thousands upon thousands and maybe millions of tons of material every day but the sun is so vast that the sun can last another several billion years so in other words we're not going to see the explosion and the collapse of the sun and then the ultimate explosion of the sun in its final throes of its existence but we see this in the stars all the time those who have access to you know the large um, telescopes see this in what they call the novas supernovas they see stars exploding and ending their existence and the fact that it says in, in Chesidus that what it quotes in the source of that is Aristotelian philosophy that the stars exist today the same way that they did always that stars do not get created nor do they die we see with the telescope not with the naked eye but with the telescope with the large telescopes you see suns or stars that explode in the end how can we go ahead and say and and, and uh, deal with this and the answer that i gave was i gave then i still give today it's an approximation we with our naked eye don't see any changes in the stars the stars will last for billions and billions of years they've existed for billions of years and therefore <coughs> we see no appreciable change as a result of them illuminating however it's only an approximation because the starlight is physical light the light of god is spiritual light spiritual light is different from physical light spiritual light does not take anything away from the source that's how i explained it to this young man and he was very happy and then he presented it to someone who is a big talmud chachim i hold of him as a talmud chachim i don't hold him as a scientist so he went over to me the next day, he says, Chaim Moshe, I understand you went to a Baal Tshuva and explained and said to him that a marshal in Chesidus is not exact. I wasn't about to go into a discussion of physics, elementary physics, with that man. He had no scientific knowledge at all, nor did he believe in any science. And all I was going to get was going to get a hard time saying that scientists know nothing you know nothing how dare you go ahead and make an opinion regarding a hasidic minor well 
I didn't want to start up with him, so I said that wasn't exactly what I said. He made a smirk and he left me alone because I wasn't interested in being persecuted by the thought police. Well, he took it upon himself that he was going to uh, change my mind some way. <coughs> the truth is he never changed my mind. Uh, he has subsequently learned some sciences. He's did, done some research on uh, given explanations on how the sun light functions on the earth and how this uh, is calculated and so on. And uh, I, I don't know if he studied anything else in the interim 53 years since we had this discussion. For my part, I asked myself, maybe I don't belong here. I left college to stay in yeshiva and I believed in the truth of the Teda and I was pursuing the truth. And if people were insistent that the Teda would say that things that are basic to physics aren't true, well, I had a problem with that. And I thought to myself that perhaps I had made a mistake in going to Lubavitch Yeshiva, where the discussions of Chassidus are, are based upon certain uh, concepts, and perhaps my thoughts were wrong for this place. But here I was after several years of giving my life toward Chassidus, I was 23 at the time, and I had spent five years away from my secular studies, and perhaps I had made a mistake in the pursuit of truth. Perhaps there was a different truth somewhere else. But in this building, I don't belong. That's how I felt as a result of that conversation with the thought police, with the Taliban. A short while later, I went to Montreal for several months because the Rebbe instructed me not to be in the same city as my kala, as my, as my bride. And so in the first, I think it was the first night I was in Montreal in the yeshiva, the, the mashpia Rabbi Yitzhameyer Gerari made a fabrengen. They told me, that his Fabrengans are interesting. So I sat and I listened to his Fabrengan. What was his Fabrengan about? He read a letter of the Rebbe to a scientist explaining that spiritual light is different than physical light, that it's only physical light, as it's explained in Chassidus, is only an approximation. It's not meant to be exact. I said, oh, Baruch Hashem, I can, I can still stay here. The Rebbe understood me. Why am I telling you this at this particular juncture? Teda has to be true. That's what our Rebbeim tell us, that the Teda is Teda Semis. It's true. If it's true, then it has to be true in all aspects of Teva and ha it has to align with things that we find out are the truth. As Rambam himself says that his knowledge of certain things did not come from Teva, it came from other scholars, but because these are things that can be um, replicated, can be, can be determined in, independently, as true, they are no less true than any prophecy. They're true. If they're true, then they're true no matter who the source is. Since you can observe a star, and you can observe the changes of the star with very, very exact instruments, so the decay, the loss of energy and therefore the loss of mass 
that a star produces is something that can be observed and, and sensed and therefore is an element of truth. And therefore the Torah has to be able to uh, be seen in the light of truth uh, that can be observed. If it's not true, then it can't be observed. If it can be observed, then the Torah has to reflect this. Otherwise, I'm not going to go the otherwise. Torah has to reflect truth because Torah is truth. That being said, uh, up until this year, I was troubled, uh, a year ago, I was troubled by certain datings of the, uh, what is called Seder Elam. And at one point, I threw up my hands and I said, well, Seder Elam is not part of the, the tradition, necessarily. And who says that we have to believe in Seder Elam? Perhaps there's other explanations that explain the historical uh, parallels between the Torah, the events of the Torah, and the events in history. And along comes Alexander Hool, H-O-O-L, for those who are listening to this video. And he went ahead and he, um, he examined the writings upon which historical records are based, and he remarkably turned everything around, not just for me, for the entire body of Jewish students who believe in the Teda, but also believe in Seder Eilam. Alexander who proved conclusively that Seder Eilam is correct and all the historical books are incorrect. All the dates, the history dates, about when the temple was destroyed, which is, they say is 586 before the Common Era. According to our Seder Elam, it's 422 before the Common Era. The difference of 164 years. And those 164 years, great scholars and historians were trying to figure out how there could be such a disparity. Alexander who explains it is the historians that have made the error. The error is based upon their, their, their uh, belief that the Persian monarchs existed completely before the Greek monarchs. And that's not true. He proves it. Only four generations of Persian monarchs existed before Alexander destroyed them. The last six monarchs really came after the destruction or the capture of the Persian Empire by Alexander. The fact that the Persians remained powerful, was, he, they were satraps, and also Alexander was killed soon after, and the Greek uh, generals were not strong enough to dominate the Persians, and the Persians still had an empire, including Egypt. The Egyptians were part of the Persian Empire up until I believe until um, Mark Anthony, um, until Mark Anthony uh, came and defeated them and made a unity with Cleopatra. And then Mark Anthony himself was destroyed by Octavianus by, by one of the Roman Caesars. But the, um, the Persians remained a force for many years after they were defeated because after Alexander dies, the generals did not have the power to dominate them. At any rate, bottom line of all of that is, is the Torah is the tells us the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed in a certain place, a certain time, rather, in the year 422, before the Common Era. And historical books will tell you 586 BCE. It has to be, I was told by a Rav Kapustin al Rashon who was a, a rabbin, a doctor who had studied history and uh, studied rabbinics. And I, I asked him, this is, it has to be 586. I said, why does it have to be 586? I, I wasn't uh, brazen enough to ask him why it had to be their date. But most of the people who studied history thought for sure it had to be 586. 
because the European scholars, the European historians spent a hundred years looking over all the documents, looking over all the dates and checking them, going through each sun, sunset and through each, you know, each uh, solar eclipse, each lunar eclipse and so on. And they went through the whole process. And this was their conclusion after a hundred years of meticulous investigation. This is what Rabbi Dr. Milikovsky, who's a professor of history at bar Line University, told me. And of course, it's wrong, it's false. Read Alexander Houle's book on the missing, he says 168 years, according to my calculation, 164 years. Whichever is right, I don't know. Just remember that there's a discrepancy between history books and what it says in Seder Olam. And lo and behold, Seder Olu is right. The Torah is true. Historians are false. And we all belong in the Vesmedrash.